YouTube crew, how's it going? It's Multiply here. Today I'm here to tell you 97, yes, you read that correctly, 97 music production tips, covering everything from sound design to workflows, common mistakes, favorite plugins, etc. And as you'll see, watching these tips, some will be short, very self-explanatory, whereas others may be a bit longer and may even need a full video or two to properly explain. So if there's any particular tip that you want me to expand upon, turn into a full 10, 20 minute video, do let me know the number of that tip in the comments below and or by sending me an email. First of all, bouncing MIDI tracks down to audio. Three reasons, stability, latency, and committing to ideas. Number two, if you try bouncing a track to audio, maybe using Freeze Flatten, and it's got a sidechain compressor on there and it just won't let you for whatever reason, maybe it pings up this message. The way around that is to set up a group, a sidechain compressor group, and therefore you can freeze or flatten or bounce the actual track which a door will allow because the sidechain compressor will be on the group. Number three is set up your sidechain compression on your leads and bases before you play in the parts. Number four, color code keeps you organized and makes your projects look nice to the eyes. Five, take your claps and snares and move them very slightly to the left. It helps them to stop getting lost under the kick drum. Nudge, 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 much better. Practice working fast. Learn your shortcuts. It's also a mindset of speed. Speed is good. Set your devices and plugins to be high quality by default. So when you load them out, they're by default high quality. Number eight, adjust your monitoring volume every five to 10 minutes because of Fletcher Munson, Fletcher Munson, and also protects your ears. Don't forget to remove silence that appears at the start of some samples. Could be a few milliseconds, could be more than a few milliseconds. Don't overlook it. Name devices, e.g. filter sweeps, to make automation more understandable and more organized. Number 11, plugins often misbehave, and so sometimes you need to bounce out multiple versions of the same thing in your DAW and then pick the one you like the best, or maybe pick the one with the least mistakes or no mistakes, hopefully. Hashtag also applies to mastering. Sometimes anyway. Number 12, make more synths and sound effects from vocal samples. And that's because we are human beings and human beings connect to the sound of a human voice more so than the sound of a computery noise, synthetic sound. Humans connect to humans. Most normal grooves swing the off 16th, so the second and the fourth and the sixth and the eighth 16th and so on. They swing these to the right. Number 14, get Serum. Number 15, sidechain compress everything. Even if it's only 1 dB or 1.5 dB, you want pretty much everything sidechained to the kit drum to get it moving up and down rhythmically. As I say, either subtly or not so subtly. Just makes it feel dancey. Very, very powerful technique that pretty much all the top guys do because it's, it's just so important. To create clean sounds, carefully create something and then do minimal processing. So along the lines of entropy and how over time, the more things you do, generally speaking, things get more and more disordered. So if you want to make something clean, create it carefully and then try your hardest not to do anything more to it. In other words, create it clean and then don't mess it up. Uh, screen saver number 17, all things being equal, louder, is better. 18, when making a change and checking it to the previous, so doing an A-B check, an A-B test, checking a change, do I like it, do I not like it, and so on, always gain compensate. 19, when mastering and doing the EQ side of mastering, measure your EQ balance, your tonal balance, your frequency balance, using something like snapshots in ozone or something similar, so you can get some scientific objective measurable data with regards to how your track is balanced frequency-wise, and that will allow you to make much better EQing decisions. 20, headphones sound dry, live venues sound wet. Number 21, more so than any other element, kick drums or bass drums sound wildly different depending on monitoring volume and the speakers slash headphones you're using. And therefore, more so than any other element when choosing or making a kit drum, you have to try loads of different monitoring volumes and try on all the different headphones, all the different speakers, you possibly have available. It's absolutely it's absolutely bonkers how different a kit drum can sound from one speaker system to the next, or even on the same speaker system or headphone system, even at just different monitoring volumes. So investigate that. 22, you don't necessarily need to layer sound to make a quote unquote 
big thick or full sound. Sometimes it's simpler, easier and cleaner to create a big thick full sound from a single layer. 23. Focus on the important rhythmic and melodic ideas and don't get distracted or, or don't confuse things by introducing seven or eight. Two or three ideas can work simultaneously, two or three melodic ideas or two or three rhythmic ideas, but seven or eight happening at the same time <laughs> confuses people. 24. Keep it simple for the dance floor, keep it complex for general listening. 25. Traditional mixing and sound design theory says you want to have the low frequencies mono in the center of a stereo image, and then as you go up the frequency spectrum to the higher frequencies, you get wider and wider and wider kind of like a triangle. There's a good reason for this, it tends to sound most natural, at least it almost always sounds more natural, and it's also more reliable in terms of playback on a wide range of different systems. However, however, it can also be fun to break the rules and try something different, like wide bass, narrow, narrow, tops, wide, middle, you, 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 you can definitely break the rules. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can, and there are certainly examples of big tracks in the world, some of the biggest tracks in the world, not many, but a few, that break the rules, wide bass, narrow tops etc so this is the way you're supposed to do it and i recommend doing it most of the time however you can still break the rules sometimes 26 you don't need to eq or compress only do it when you definitely know why you're doing it. 27 all the mixing is is deciding at each moment in time what you want the listener to be listening to and then engineering it 28 Normally or traditionally, the sub bass will be an octave or two below the root of a chord, the roots note. Take the root note of that chord and then transpose an octave or two, or sometimes three, down. 29. If you have isotope ozone and you're using it for mastering, only use IRC three or four. Number 30. Get a good reverb. My personal favorite is Toraverb from D16. However, the probably the most highly recommended overall from all the top pros and right down to people new at production. It'd probably be Valhalla. So I personally recommend Toy Reverb, but my next most recommendation will be the Valhalla reverbs. 31. Mastering is much, much easier. In fact, much times a thousand, much, much easier when it's the kick predominantly triggering the limiter. And therefore, when setting up your mix and dialing in all the levels, Almost always you want a kick to be the highest peaking thing when looking at the levels in your DAW. Better to get it right in the mix than to fix it in mastering. Better to get it right in the sound design, songwriting and arranging than it is to fix it in the mix. 34. Mixing and mastering is much less important than most people think. Yes, you need to know the basics and certainly being better at mixing and mastering can help, but without that initial idea, it's not really that helpful at all. Another way of looking at this, still on the same point, you would listen to an interesting or exciting track that was poorly mixed and mastered, whereas you wouldn't listen to a boring track that was perfectly engineered. 35, depending on your track, leave at least 0.5 dB of headroom on your master to allow for conversion to MP3. Depending on your track is an important part of this because some tracks need over a dB of headroom for conversion to MP3 on SoundCloud. Remember, SoundCloud converts to 128K MP3. So some tracks you can get away with maybe 0.4 dB of headroom at a push for conversion to 128K MP3 on SoundCloud, whereas others will need at least 1 dB, maybe even 1.2, and in extreme cases, 1.5. 36. Different synths produce different standard waveforms. In other words, the sawtooth is not the same in this synth, it's not the same in this synth, it's not the same in this synth, so, and, and, and so on. It's, even though you may think a sawtooth or a square is a very well-defined thing, looks like this or this, each synth reproduces it differently. And so if your sound heavily depends on these standard waveforms, find one you like. 37. Each synth does unison and treats voice phase differently. So try a few and pick your favourite. And if you want to hyper nerd out on your unison, research microtuning interesting stuff. 39. It works well to name your track after a vocal phrase or a vocal sample that's clearly audible in your track. Makes people much more likely to remember it. Hashtag Roughneck Bass. Number 40. There is no correlation between how long you spent on a track and how good it will be. Sometimes the best tracks happen in three, four, five, six hours. Other times the best tracks happen in 300, 400, 500, 
600 hours. Also, there is no correlation between track count and how good the overall track will be. Some of the best tracks in the world have 12 tracks or even just six or seven, whereas some of the best tracks have three or 400. 42, reverb on sub bass, whether it's from a bass line or a bass or a kick, reverb on sub bass makes a rumbly sound, makes the bass rumbly and less focused, which is usually bad, but in some genres, sometimes like dark techno, can be quite cool. 43, look at the spectrum analyzer in terms of octaves. Every time you double the hertz, you go up one octave. And so you could kind of look at the frequency spectrum in these octaves, say 40 hertz to 80 hertz, 80 hertz to 160, 160 to 320, and so on. Bounce reverb to audio, chop it up, apply fades and so on to more precisely control it. 45, in general, a small time on a reverb, or maybe a low feedback on a delay, tends to work best for fast BPM genres, whereas a long reverb tail, a long reverb time, and a high delay feedback will work better for slower BPMs. 46, in the final master, almost all the time, the sub bass, the level of the sub bass, almost always sits between minus five and minus seven dB on the final master. Almost always. Do some analysis yourself. It's it's interesting stuff. 47. Pitch envelopes define the start of a synth or a bass. For a bass, it will sweep down. For a synth, normally it will sweep up. In the case of a synth, if you have it sweeping up, it gives it a whoopy sound. If it sweeps down, it becomes more of a stabby, plucky sound. 48. The length of a kick drum tail or the body of a kick drum determines what you can do with the bass line. Because if you have, say, a maximized kick drum tail, that completely eats up the space for a bass line at that moment in time. Remembering that in general, you can't layer low frequencies. 49, sidechain compression settings, so the key ones here being release, threshold, and ratio, are a key component, or also the input signal, are a key component in determining the groove. Number 50, research FF1 mode for sidechain compression if you use Ableton. White noise or equivalent effect samples are a way to fill up the track in a way that's precisely not capturing the listener's attention. Think of white noise as the opposite of something with musical content. It's simply noise, sound, without any real meaning or significance or content or interest. And so you can fill up a track with it without taking the listener's attention away from maybe a synth or a vocal or whatever else you want them to listen to. 52. For Build-ups, some genres use tension and release, other genres use anticipation and impact. These are very different. You need to figure out for your particular genre you're making which of the two it is. Is it tension and release or anticipation and impact? And then construct your build with these terms in your mind. Sampling recordings is one of the easiest ways to make sounds that no one's ever heard before. Take a sound, throw it into a sampler, brr, pitch it up, pitch it down, apply a pitch envelope, etc. Throw a reverb on there. Brand new sound. Brilliant. 54. Give your track a narrative either using samples or vocal recordings, e.g., Internet Friends, or classic high ranking. Very entertaining. Very entertaining indeed. Some may say an inspiration for lots of multiplier. 55. If you have Serum, research the stereo filter offset control on the filter. It's called Pan. Use it to create natural width and or modulate it to create natural stereo movement. 56, there are three dimensions, approximately three dimensions to how full or how thick a sound can be. First of all, frequency. So and there's a few dimensions to that as well. You've got how many octaves of the frequency spectrum your sound is taking up. You've also got how thick or how dense each of those octaves are in terms of the harmonics or maybe filling it up with white noise. Another dimension, stereo imaging, which again has two dimensions. You have your mono versus wide sounds or left and right, or so front to back with reverb. So a dry sound will be at the front of the mix, a wet, a wet with reverb sound will be at the back of the mix. So there's a, that's another dimension. And then the third main dimension for how full or how thick a sound will be, a track will be amplitude. For example, that will sound thicker than that. All of which relates to 
RMS. 57 groove and or rhythm has two primary dimensions, time, such as swing, and volume or amplitude, such as velocity. But you can create rhythm or groove also using sound design, tone and timbre, if you're super creative. It's difficult, but I mean, drum and bass guys do it. <laughs> and drum and bass noises. That was, my, that was me doing a drum and bass. Next, make your music fun, e.g. Crookers or Pleasure Craft or Sebastian Leger. Le Leger. It's about like this. Or Botneck, Knife Party, or The Prodigy. 59. Start your track with an interesting idea. Remember, you can always build an interesting idea into a track. Don't accidentally build a track without anything interesting in it. Make sure you start the track with this interesting idea, whether it's a chord, a melody, a sound, whatever it is, or a rhythm, a groove. Make sure you start there, otherwise you can accidentally create a track with no real sources of interest. Think in terms of energy, rhythm, vibe, emotion, and not in terms of punchy, clean, analog, mono, compatible. They're just technical terms that are there to serve these things, which is the, which are the important, the whole point of music. 61, dance floor tracks should have one main root groove, one main I, I tried to say groove and rhythm at, at the same time there. One main groove, one main rhythm. Rhythm. Wave type determines loudness. Mono is louder than wide. Dry is louder than wet. 65, use auto filter for filter sweeps, but EQ8 for static filtering. Note, the algorithms are different, and in the case of auto filter, each DAW have an equivalent. In the case of auto filter, it's designed to be automated or moved moved, whereas EQ8 is designed to sound best static. Again, each DAW will have equivalent different filters for either stationary or moving. All the sixes, 66. The magic behind catching a bandwagon early is to see the potential in a novel idea. Remember, the very first tracks in an emerging, trendy bandwagon genre, the first tracks aren't very good, they just have a novel idea. Could be 808s in the case of trap, or aggressive sounds, cacophonic noises in the case of dubstep, at least modern, modern dubstep, or it could be in the case of Mumbaton, a BPM of 108-ish with that Dembow rhythm. You have to spot this novel idea and see the potential in it, because when the genre is new, there isn't really any great tracks to get you excited necessarily. You have to see the potential in the novel idea and then make some good tracks. Make a riser using a synth you like and using pitch bend. Note, you may need to adjust the pitch bend limits in the synth you're using. Serum's comb filters are a big part of the modern aggressive sound. In fact, it's, in my opinion, by far the biggest influential single part of modern aggressive sounds. Importantly though, you need to crank the resonance. Modern aggression sounds, noises. Duda, 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 duda. Steve Duda. Just a... Uh, celebrating Steve Duda. I think we need a, a, a Steve Duda celebration. Oh, that's an idea for another video. A Steve Duda celebration day. National holiday, I reckon. In, worldwide, inter, international holiday. Steve Duda day. Leave it with me. Layering triplets with sixteenths almost never works. Learning and practicing sound design helps you better understand and deconstruct the music you're hearing, allowing you to therefore make better decisions, mixing and mastering decisions. So. Just allows you to better understand what you're hearing. Just allows you to better understand what you're hearing. All of a sudden, it's not just a bunch of sounds and noises. You're hearing dry versus wet. You're hearing stereo imaging. You're hearing pitch. You're hearing saturation, filtering, distortion, modulation, etc. So, sound design is useful to know. Syncopation, which is the technical term for an offbeat rhythm, is arguably the most important part of dance music. So much so, it's used all the time, even when you don't consciously realize it's this syncopation behind what's going on. For example, a chord change tends to sound better on the offbeat, the eighth, than on the downbeat. All because of syncopation. Fancy technical terms, fancy technical terms. Counterpoint melody, do it. Don't necessarily use compression if you can engineer it exactly how you desire in the first place. In general, compression is simply gain or volume automation. It's not magic. Yes, there are some fancy compression, 
compressors that also do things like saturation as a part of the analog modeling. But broadly speaking, a compressor is simply volume or gain automation or modulation, depending on how you want to define it. You can quote unquote clip or go into the red, go above zero on internal meters, but not on the master. As if you clip the master or go into the red quote unquote above zero on the master, it creates unpredictable results, which is a problem because maybe it sounds great through your speakers, but it sounds horrible through somebody else's. Confusingly, theoretically, you shouldn't clip going into or out of plugins. I say confusingly because most of the time, if you're using good plugins, you can definitely clip going into or out of it up to a certain point. So theoretically you shouldn't, but in practice, it's kind of okay. Just, just be careful though. 70 Serum. 77, Serum. A point about Serum. Serum doesn't just make squealy bass sounds. It can make almost every type of synthetic sound, whether it's a sound effect, a pad, a lead, uh, chill to lead aggressively, literally, literally every kind of synthetic. Yeah, that's the right word. It can make pretty much every kind of synthetic sound. And it's, it's, it's incredible. It does more than just squeal basses. Take a look at the factory presets that come included. They're incredibly good. They don't look good because they haven't purposefully tried to confuse you to make it look more confusing than it actually is. Hashtag summer. What you can learn from looking at the factory presets is an awful lot of interesting synthesis principles. Principles that you could say are standard, but principles that, to be honest, most people just don't seem to use for whatever reason. Culture, probably. But they're incredibly good, so do check them out. The factory presets in Serum, go through each category, try and deconstruct them. They're not actually that complicated to look at, so you can work it out most of the time, which is good. 78, DC offset. It eats headroom without providing any additional value, so it's generally bad. However, does look very cool, doesn't it? MIDI effects are extremely powerful and often undervalued, underappreciated as a way to spark some ideas off to get a track going. MIDI effects, use them, they're really good. Isotope Trash 2 is still the best plugin for distortion. Outputs Exhale is still my favorite plugin for vocally synth sounds. And overall, Isotope, D16, and Yuhi, Yui, Yuhi, however you say it. Isotope, D16, and Yuhi, these are my favorite three companies for creating consistently incredible plugins. They just, almost everything they make is absolutely incredible. 83, don't use a synthesizer to create a real sound, such as a violin or piano, any sort of real noise. Because synthesizers, even if they're incredibly complicated and very expensive and all that sort of good stuff, or an incredibly well engineered and programmed and stuff, they will never ever really ever get close to anything like a real sound. Like, even the very best synthesized real sounds, the very best synthesized pianos, at best they still sound like a cheap, horrible piano. So what you want to do, if you want a real sound, such as a, a flute, a trumpet, a piano, anything real, use a sample-based instrument, such as a contact library, not a synthesizer. 99% of the time, you will not hear a difference between different EQs, it's all placebo effect. However, some of the more expensive Expensive EQ plugins may give you additional features, such as a steeper curve, or maybe a cool saturated low pass, or maybe a, an interesting resonancy sort of thing. So the more expensive EQs can be useful, but what you're really buying them for is the additional features. A standard sort of filter shape sounds broadly speaking the same. Certainly it's as good as your built-in EQ, such as EQ8 in Ableton, assuming you keep it all up to date. If you compare the EQs from say eight years ago to now, they, they have improved, but certainly say the built-in EQ in Ableton is just as good for normal EQing than anything else. Parallel processing isn't magic. It's a, it's a, very, it's a very cool sounding term. You can kind of sound all pro if you like. A parallel process to that. I did parallel compression or par screensaver. Parallel screensaver. Parallel processing is nothing more than a dry wet control, mixing unprocessed to processed. But parallel processing sounds much cooler. So if you're telling your friends what you've done, Say parallel processing because it sounds better. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of parallel processing, but the key point of this tip is it's not magic, it's just a dry wet control. Incredibly useful, but it is just a dry wet control. E0, approximately 41 hertz, is loosely speaking the lowest note you can get away with if you want your track to be reproducible, consistently reproducible on all the big systems. So, broadly speaking, consider E0 the lowest note you can play or engineer sequence program.
E0 is the lowest. 87, saturation adds frequencies or enhances frequencies, kind of like adding them, whereas filtering removes frequencies or technically attenuates sometimes. So loosely speaking, in general, think of saturation as adding, filtering as removing. There is a reason every good distortion plugin has a filter pre and post, so a pre-filter and a post-filter. In other words, a filter either side of the saturation, the distortion, there's a reason it's, it's really, really important. It kind of comes with saturation. It's so important. It comes with saturation. It comes with distortion. It I should do a video on that. 89, unsure about dithering? Read the Isotopes Guide to Dithering. It's free and it explains everything you need to know about dithering, what it is, how to do it, when you might need to do it. It only takes 20 minutes. Uh, depends how fast you read. Dithering is just one of those things you need to learn. It takes 15 to 20 minutes to learn and then you never have to worry about it again in your entire life. It's, it's really cool. And as a bonus, the triangular dither in Ableton is absolutely fine. You don't necessarily need to have a very special sort of dither from the guys like Ozone, Isotope. Yeah, the, the triangular one's fine. But you do, you do have to do it. Also, related, number 90, you can pretty much learn everything you need to know, theory-wise anyway, from reading the Isotope from reading the isotope guide to mastering. I think they have a separate mastering guide and or maybe a, an Ozone manual. So basically read those and they explain all the theory you need to know about mastering. You will, of course, still need to practice and spend some time learning the tools and becoming familiar with things and how they sound, but you can learn pretty much all the theory from just reading the guides. For free, wowzers trousers. Good or even great drums are by far the hardest things to make from scratch snare drums in particular. So much so that I reckon I could teach someone to make a, an amazing bass sound or an amazing synth or pad or, or whatever in, I don't know, uh, some short amount of time. Basically, it's it's very, it's something that most people can do. Basically something you can do without too much difficulty necessarily. However, drums, just properly, properly difficult. I mean, once you've learned bass and lead sound design and maybe like pads and a few sound effects as well, you can you can make a really bad sounding drum after not too long, but to go from bad to good and then even from good to great, it's, it's, it's just very, very difficult. Not something to get into until you've learned everything else and, and, and you're feeling optimistic. 92, often the biggest artists in the world have no idea what their gear's doing, whether that's the old school techno house guys, not really knowing what their drum machines are doing, but or the baseline generators or whatever, not really knowing what they're doing, but kind of twiddling buttons and just choosing the result, just basically messing about until it sounds cool and then recording it, whether it's that or a newer producer not really knowing what compression does or not knowing how synth is working, but just kind of playing around and then going, that's, I like that. That is a good thing that's popped out for some reason. Basically, technical knowledge is independent from artistic judgment. When Joel Zimmerman, AKA Dead Mouse, talks about compression, specifically in his masterclass, Confusingly, confusingly, almost all the times he mentions compression, he's talking about sidechain compression. Whereas most of the time, when people hear the word compression, they think about normal compression, not sidechain compression. So, important, if you hear Dead Mouse talking about compression in his masterclass, or anywhere else, to be fair, most of the time actually, he's talking about sidechain compression. And thinking about it now, maybe lots of other top, or just people who get interviewed also do that, which is confusing. Yeah. Epiphany there. Well, I, the, the reason why I say it is I know in the case of Deadmau5, because you can, you can see his masterclass and, and you can see when he's talking about compression, most of the time he's actually talking about sidechain compression because you, you can actually see his DAW. So maybe I've stumbled onto something. We should be more clear as a community, sidechain compression versus compression. When I say sidechain compression, I always mean sidechain compression. Whereas if I just say compression, I mean, not sidechain compression for this exact reason. I'll do a video on it. 94, we're nearly there. Separation is literally opposite from gluing a track together. You can't have both. You can't say you want instrument separation so they, they sound very distinct and you also say you want to glue it, glue it together because they're literally completely opposing ideas. Gluing together versus separation. One is not better than the other, by the way. They're just different. You can have a very well separated mix. Everything can have its own place. Everything's all very, you can hear all the elements in a very distinct way. That's not better or worse than everything sounding very homogenous and together and glued, glued. So uh, 
just an, an important psychological distinction there between gluing and separation. A vocal will almost always need to be center of attention. I reckon it's cool to use modern talking again. And finally, if in doubt, if stuck, if you just you just don't know what to do, whether it's, uh, what do I do, what do I do that? No, that, no, do I mix this? Like, what do, what do I, even, if you're just, if you're just a bit panicky, if you did, if you don't know what to do and you just, you, what, what do I need to do? If in doubt, W, W, S, D. What would Skrillex do? And there you have it. 97, 97 music production tips. Wowzers, trousers. And as I say, if there's any in particular that maybe you want me to elaborate on, I mean, I've kind of sparked my own imagination with a few of them. So if there's any you want me to elaborate on, send me an email and or in the comments below, stick the number of the comment or maybe a question with it, and I will do a video on it. My name has been Multiplier, and I will catch you guys on the long video karate. Karate chop. On the flippity flip.